now when we last left our terrible typhoon project, we were getting ready to true up the, the trailing edge and set the rudder hinges in place. One of the simpler jobs that we've been working on lately. Although it take, this little piece, it takes longer than you think it does to make this piece. But once you have it, and you've gone through it once, the second one goes in about half the time. It was figuring out the first one, how, where, the first one I had this bulkhead on, right under the horn, that was a problem. There's other little problems that I think I've resolved most of them on this, so if you're doing a take apart plane, just making a copy of this with your shapes and sizes might be a good choice. We really did spend a whole bunch of time fitting and checking and doing things relating to the rudder, making a pattern over and over again. But I think the final result is I think we're going to have something that I I think it's really going to look like a typhoon and yet still have the performance of a real stunt ship. Well, once that's trimmed, the last thing I want to do is just hit this, see if there are any spots that need to be dressed off. This will show me all the high spots. And I need to lay out the little piece where I have it already cut. I just need to figure out the little piece that's going to go under here that'll attach right to this piece. Next thing I need to do is lay out where I want the hinges on this. Here we got two inch in space. Here comes the phone again. Two inch in spacing. I have the tool, of course, that has one side is the smaller hinges, and we have some small IM hinges here that I don't know if we're going to be able to use them or not, but this will get us relatively nice hinge pockets. And we need to get the hinges in place so I can do the, the final sanding and shaping. I'll mark each one with a center line. These are small hinges. It's real easy to cut the hinge pocket with a knife. I want to work off a center line. Now these are hinges that used to be made by by IM. I don't think they make them anymore, but Mike <coughs> graciously donated, or yeah, without realizing he donated, I just I have to thank him. Anyway, nice little hinges. The Dubro half A hinges are pretty much the same. Sometimes what can happen here is if you don't take enough wood out, and I didn't take enough wood out, see what I did, I just slid it and shoved it in. I need to get in there and pull out the thickness of this amount of wood with the knife. Or else what happens is where you come to a hinge, it'll have a, a pucker in the final, you know, output. Now I can feel these are these are too big. Let me get that knife. So that what I want to do is get into each one and you can always use that a Dremel tool or something too if the holes are a little bit too big of course nothing bad happens it's when they're too small especially on a plane that gets glued together and you can't change things Okay, now there's no pucker in that, and just to make sure, I can run my hand here to make sure I don't have any. I've been looking at this long enough, and I'm trying to make sure I want to make any changes to the shape right now, because once I'm done with this, as like I said, I want to answer the phone and stop working on the tail. I mean, no matter how many times you look at it, you always want to change it just a little bit. I'm happy with the outer edge. What I'm going to do is harden it up with thin CA, but I want to make sure I have all the fits exactly how I want them. And I don't have any, any little places where the, the hinge pockets are puffed up. And then the next thing I need to do is make up the horn for the raised water. 
but I make that out of laminated plywood. Five laminates of 60 foot plywood. That's what I want to do. I want to lay out the, the ray rotor linkage. The linkage is going to come from the center, just below, and I'd like to have it just below here. This will be the, and I'd love to have a pen that writes. The idea is I don't want to have the wire going down or running up. I'd like to have it in just about a two degree down angle. The next thing I want to lay out here, I call it the fudge factor. If, if we were making a scale plane, the rudder would be up over the stab. Well, the reality is almost no stunt model has the, the rudder come up over the stab, if it's even close to being scale. It's, it's what I call the fudge factor. So even Al Rabe allowed a certain amount that you could fudge it by moving the rudder back and exposing the front of the stab. In our model, we're exposing almost the whole stab. Otherwise, the side profile of the fuselage would be wrong. See, on Al's model, and I mean, his is about, not about, it probably is the most scale of all of them. And, and even so, this, the fudge factor, this front part of the stab is always exposed. In fact, the, the edge that comes down. Now, I have a thing I'm going to do that isn't really scale. I add a radius in here and a little bit of a baby fin and it kind of takes your eye off the fact that that rudder is coming down much further back than it normally should be to be a scale model. And on a Kent Tyser, which is a different fuselage straight than, than the standard one, notice where the rudder comes down almost at the hinge line. And that's kind of standard for most almost scale planes. But the only way you can really avoid this is by making a plane more scale and then there's in my estimation, some sacrifice in performance or alter the, the fuselage side to where the, the rudder is much closer. And, and I don't know that that's a better choice either, but there's, by putting this little radius in here, it kind of detracts your eye from it, from what's really happening. And even on the Spitfires and Seafires, we had a certain amount that we had to fudge it. It just can't be really scale without trading away some of the other characteristics that we want. So it's a compromise and we try to make it the best compromise we can. Chris Ashley does that more of the stab is exposed than normally would be scale, but the little, we'll call it the fudge factor, by putting that little radius in there and that little fin, even though it's not scale, it kind of hides and detracts from the fact. Now on a typhoon, it'll be very small. It takes you, it, it's kind of an optical illusion. It doesn't draw your eye down to that line running into the middle of the stab. You can see where this actually winds up. Now by having a little bit of a, oh, kind of a little non-scale fin, it's gonna, it's gonna totally lose the fact that that line is running right into the middle of the stab. Even put that little piece on the plans. And I've made it oversized because what I want to do is after I get the air epoxy light in there, I want to just fine tune it and get it exactly the way I want it so it's not an obvious thing, and yet it still takes your, your mind off of that angle. Otherwise, that angle just runs right into the hinge line. You have to look at it from a lot of different angles. And I wanted to get the, my, my objective was to get this little fillet in get that done, and while that is drying, then I could make up the little horn, the little ray rudder linkage horn. And sometimes you just have to let it look at it from enough angles. Well, if it were a scale model, it would be a totally different thing. We could move that whole tail right up maybe to here, but then I know the side view of the plane would present in corners. It wouldn't have that sharp look where it really drops the tail in the hourglass, and you, I really don't want to trade that away. Anyway, I'll call it the fudge factor for lack of a better word and 
I guess one of the things we're going to have to do is just live with it. You do look at it from a lot of angles. It really does have, a, have the look of a typhoon with that little drop piece in the back. Actually, it looks like an SB6 from some angles. You're wanting to cut a part like this and you want to get... The reason I made this out of plywood, first of all, people are going to launch the plane like this. Let's be real. Balsa wood isn't going to last. <laughs> it's not going to... Maybe plywood won't last. I don't know. But when you want to get a blend from plywood to balsa, this is, an, this is a really good trick. Always make less of a curve than you want. Once that piece is glued in place, then you can do with a sanding drum and just go at it real gradually. Otherwise, while that piece, let me get the book. When you go to get it up here, and that last little piece, it always breaks or chips or whatever. Now, I want to sand this down. And I just go, well, we're almost ready for that air epoxy. Some of the best tricks I know when you want to protect edges. These balsa edges get real thin. There's a real thin coat of right along the edge. Don't use any kicker if necessary, if possible. These edges, you know, realistically, these are going to take a beating in the lifespan of the plane, and we hope it's a long lifespan. There's just almost no way you can protect yourself from the, the normal, of course, if you don't fly the plane, that's one way. But in a normal course of flying and competing, anything that's an edge, you see up here, this edge up here is another a vulnerable place. So I want to harden up all of the edges. And once I just, just lightly sand these down, just ever so lightly, I'll be ready to put the air epoxy in here. I want to mix up some air epoxy, get a fillet in here, a fillet in here, any other little spots I need to touch up. There's an amazing lot of work goes into making this little piece. When you look at it, you pick it up, and you know, oh, peach. And then you realize you spent a whole week making it, or, or whatever. A long time, anyway. You know, I want to get some, I'm really mixing the air epoxy well, because we're going to try to get a real thin fillet in there. Anytime you mix air epoxy, when you think it's mixed, give it another two minutes of mix. We don't need dye in this. The normal color will be fine. And you can see over the course of building this airplane how many different uses we've found for, as we're going along, how many we've found for this good material. It's really a good material. Now what's handy is sometimes it, it, you want to have this kind of a shape where it just disappears. A spoon is real good. And as you get to the end, the lay the spoon down. It's this motion here. You can see I've almost got the spoon flat. Now, from that last little spot, because it sands so easily, I don't really care if I leave just a little bit on, but there's no point leaving more than we have to. And tomorrow, when this all dries out, we'll be able to sand it out. Now, the last time I, I was showing Micah Stella how to do fillets the way I do them, I like to use a screwdriver or whatever tool, use the end of your nose if you have to, is get the material in place first. Make sure it's, it's got a good bond. You just have to watch out that bird runs over and eats air epoxy. to make a little bit of a radius up here. It took me a long time to realize about that fudge fact when I could look at things years ago and I never could figure out exactly what wasn't correct, but that edge of the tail. Now you can always get away with it, you just make a twin red of point. 
for. Don't make a scale plane. Just make a, uh, you know, a, a plane that, that doesn't have a real prototype. But anyway, we kind of enjoy this. I'm going to try to start at this point and work my way down. I'm going to start up here and work my way this way. Now by holding the spoon more straight, I can get less of a radius. Now I need that razor. Again, a nice thing is that the material is so soft, it doesn't it doesn't make a big problem. Even if you just sort of leave these on, you can sand them right off. But the strength is very good. This is kind of a complex shape, so I want to be careful. Whoops. Let's see, which, which is the lucky finger today? Now I can always do this, which, just get a little bit of alcohol. Oh, I feel so good on the cuts. Well, you don't want to do this over and over and over again because you're working alcohol down in with the material, and it, to some degree, a small degree, deteriorates. But one little wipe certainly isn't going to hurt. Now, it's always good if we can put this up by a heating vent while it dries. It'll just save us a little bit of time in a dry, even though we're not going to work on it until tomorrow. Heat is always good for the drying of any epoxy. And believe me, the heat almost never shuts off in this house. Every year since 19, I'm going to have to go back to, God, I think 87, 86. The last plane, except for Miss Ashley, that I built without having a ray water. The reason I always, I always took advantage of this is my planes usually trim out with bigger than, than average propellers. And this is a real big help now because we're going to be using a 91. We would think we're going to wind up with some kind of very big prop. First off, it's a it's a great trim feature, and I believe it was Al Raid that gets the credit for the invention. Or, otherwise, they would call it a windy raid or, or or whatever. It's a great trim feature. Another good part of it is that it adds almost no weight at all. The amount of weight it adds is negligible. If it's set up the way I'm going to show on this little storyboard, it's infinitely adjustable. So can do what I call the on and off test. Just take the linkage off the rudder and, and set a little post or an adjuster to hold the rudder where you think it should be and see if it's working for you. In the early days, what we used to do is put an eyelet right in the edge of the elevator and then bend a 90 degree bend in it. You'll look at back at some of the old videos, 92 Cardinal video. From this end would have some threads and a clevis. And that way, I don't know. The, the, the bad thing about this was when you were finishing the part, this was, the rod was always attached. You couldn't get rid of the rod. Now, the upgrade that we have now, and it's a small upgrade, is at this junction we use a ball link, a 256 Dubro ball link. And what that means, you can take it off. You can just snap it off while you're especially finishing the plane. When this was permanently attached, finishing a plane, especially a plane that doesn't come apart, this was a constant thorn in your side. Now with the with the ball link, it snaps right off. You could even use a ball link at both ends, I guess. I also always make the horn, if this is the hinge line, I try to get the horn, now see I've shown this incorrectly, I try to get the horn up closer to the hinge line. As you put this further and further back away from the hinge line, you get some funny exponential. You get the best I feel from from about 12 or 13 years of doing this and, and retrofitting a lot of ships. When you can get the attachment point 
at least an eighth of an inch from the hinge line. That seems to work well. And this is the critical part. In the edge of the elevator, where you have your tube, assuming you have a tube or an eighth inch horn, to get the ball link about three eighths of an inch back, three eighths of an inch from the front, and almost up touching the tube. Now, at that location, I feel you get the most because now with, with an infinitely adjustable horn you can and of course you adjust the horn that's your trim feature but this is a permanent thing it's hard to replace this so my suggestion is try to get the ball located at this point make the horn as big as possible even make it oversized and once you get the final say the final adjustment is here you can always trim that off well, but it's always better if, if you make the horn small and you need one more adjustment then what do you do now, if this is the center line of the fuselage, I always feel I like to have it set so when the controls are in neutral, I've got one or two degrees of offset. For the sake of argument, let's call it one degree, rather than dead neutral, the slightest bit out. And then, usually I wind up between 10 and 12 degrees, and I've measured this so many times, but if the rudder is bigger, in this case, we have a, it may be that you only have 8 degrees or 6 degrees or less. But what will happen is on full down, boy, that's a terrible drawing. On full down, you can tell I didn't graduate art school. What will happen is, this will be for your outside squares, top of the hourglass, top of the verticals. And it will compensate and allow you to run bigger and bigger propellers, which is the whole idea of the four strokes or the whole idea of the 90 or the 72 or the laser is with this adjustment, when I'm in neutral, I want to have one degree of offset and at maximum throw, somewhere between one and 10. And this is an infinitely adjustable thing. And the way you adjust it is on the horn, you can either make the rod longer or shorter, but eventually you run out to where it's in reverse mode, then you have to move the controller out or in depending on which way you want this to go. It's a great trim feature. It gives you a lot of choices when you're at the flying field and changing props, changing motors and whatever. And I would suggest, now the only reason we didn't put this on this Astro, of course I wanted to try this thing where the elevators were real tight to the body, but it doesn't mean I can't make another elevator for the outside or just modify that elevator somehow. Because I really think the plane would have been better with a Ray Brother. And I would suggest using that pretty much on any plane that you're going to build. Now these are just three places, the real, the real good spots, I call them. When you're trimming a plane, and right here it tends to, because of a bigger propeller, it'll always tend to go soft. It'll always tend to go soft up here or up here. Well, most of the time we need to add tip weight, and then you're getting rocking and some other gyrations that might be undesirable. But in this case, when these areas are nice and solid, what I do is back out the rave rudder so it's less and less until, because if you have more than you need, it's just going to eat up power. What it does, at some point in time, it's going to get a little soft up here. When it gets soft, back out another click. Same thing here, until you've got all your bases covered, especially the overhead aid if you've got a soft and I can't draw it up here because I'm if the outside part of the overhead aid if that tends to get soft crank in another turn or two it's a good choice it's a good trim feature the nice thing about it it, it teaches you how to trim planes so you don't go too far you wouldn't want to crank in so much rave rudder that it, that it was just bleeding off all its airspeed up here either but it lets you fine tune it like a needle valve it weighs almost nothing it's just to me, it's the best of all worlds, and the really best part is if you don't like it, you snap the linkage off or just put a linkage up to a, a solid hard point in the fuselage, and you don't even need it. It didn't cost you anything. It's kind of like free lunch. Wish we could get free pizza. Now, the way I like to do this, I'll, of course, again, I want to get the horn right up near the hinge line if possible. I want to make it a little bigger than I think it'll have to be. I'll make up the horn from five laminates of 64th plywood with the grain going every time I laminate in another direction. Then I can cut the horn out, inset it into the wood. And the reason I don't like to use a nylon horn is I don't like to see the bolts and things in the back or the screws. And this gets painted to match the plane, it kind of makes it disappear.
the grain is going in this direction. Now I have the grain going in the other direction. Five laminates is plenty. It makes for a really bulletproof horn. Super light, you glue it in place. Now the next time I glue this, I'll put it on a 45 degree angle. And this is going to be the last thing we do today. I'm just going to glue this in place. Notice how I have the little notch, so the reason that is so it doesn't run into its own hinge line. I'm going to glue that in, and we'll come back to the shop tomorrow and pick this up. Now, once this is dry, and I like to let it dry overnight, what I like to do is take a flat block and go into the fillet until I'm actually on the curve of the fillet. This doesn't take long. This is a good little trick. Get the flat to go right up onto the fillet. Once I have that curve, then I have my three little blocks with various, and you can carve your own, you can make these out of balsa, but it really isn't, it really isn't a critical thing. I like to take and then go back where the flat block is and go right up onto the fillet. So that it's one continuous motion. If you go this way, what happens? You wind up running the potential of carving a ditch. If you go this way, there's almost no chance you're going to carve a ditch. Yeah, it doesn't matter in my case. It's, I didn't bother trying to make this all smooth and pretty because I know it's going to be relatively easy to get it sanded in. It's only going to be a few minutes. I'll have the shape. And if I go too far, if I, if I sand too much of it away, just go back in at the end of today and lay another coat in. It bonds to itself relatively easily. My little pledge area up here, I want to get that blended in too. Now you can see the low spots. A lot of choices. I can sand a little more of that away. If I want to, I can go to a little bit smaller radius block and just make the radius of the fillet that much smaller, which is okay. If I do it this way, you can almost guarantee you're not going to cause a ditch. Now I'm almost down to nothing. Eventually I'm going to get to... Now there's only one little spot left and I'll just work that. Real important that this edge be 64th ply with its double 60. Because otherwise, if these edges are not hard and you sand them, you get even sand them, you can damage them. Look how quick that sands right out. Now I want to get uh, this is all sanded out, by the way. I want to get a couple of coats of clear on this, and this is one of the areas where I. I always keep thinking, where do you gain and where do you lose with a take-apart plane? This is where you start to make up yardage. Because right now, if the plane were in one piece, finishing these parts from this point on, doing the masking, the sanding, you know what's nice, a part like this, you could just put in your lap and sand it. Or you could stand here by the sanding bench and sand it. When you're working on a plane that's all in one piece, it can get really clumsy and really awkward, and you, you're constantly, put, at least I am, constantly putting dents and dings and things in it. So, of all the things I try to evaluate, where do you gain and where do you lose, this is one of the big gains. This is one of the touchdowns, is when you can finish parts in your hand, in this case we'll get maybe three coats of clear on, and then we're going to tissue this. And we may get this all done in one day because of the quick drying time. Again, a take-apart plane is always a lot of give and takes. Sometimes 
some of the steps like making the fits and everything, which I've tried to outline. Uh, although I'll say the second one is going a lot quicker than the first one, and I assume next year's plane will go even quicker. And that's, I guess that's the biggest lesson of all. I didn't think of how I was going to hold this. <laughs> anyway. Now the objective here is get the first coats of dope on relatively thin, let the wood swell, let it dry back down, and we'll sand it down again. I want to fuel proof the inside of this if I, as much as I possibly can. And I guess one of the lessons is if it's the first time you're making a take apart plane, be prepared that it is going to take a little extra time, but then somewhere down the road, it gets to be relatively straightforward, like any other motor skill, I guess. Now, the, the point here is, I want the wood swells to expand, because when this dries, it's going to be a whole other shape, especially where there's balsa and plywood, there's going to be little edges. And then I'll lightly sand this all down, and then get maybe this afternoon get the tissue on it. So I got it on so thin here, and I want to get that first. The first thing, you don't want to put the first coat on really thick, because it's not going to get any bind. And you certainly want to be real careful around the fillets where they end, because we're only going to bring tissue up to about a quarter of an inch of the fillets. Many problems that I've seen, in fact, Rich Jacobone is one of the ones that had the problem is they don't put enough clear dope on under the tissue, and then you get little bubbles, little places where the tissue is not adhering. So I'm, I'm making sure I get plenty of coats on this. And that, this is one of the things I don't, don't want to skimp on, because what happens is when you press the tissue down, the extra dope comes right up through the tissue anyway. But if it's the other way and you're light on dope, it's hard to press it down through. You don't, you don't get that real good bond. So if in doubt, put an extra coat under the tissue, that would be my suggestion. Waiting for that dope to dry, I can get a coat of dope. In fact, I can get two. What I'm going to do with the, with the fuselage is two coats of clear, medium tissue. I'm convinced that that's a weight saving over the primer. And there's, a, there's plenty of places in the plane where the primer is an appropriate material, but it can be heavy. And I'm trying to get every little bit of weight out of here because we're going to be carrying around a relatively heavy motor, heavy fuel tank, maybe. We don't know yet until Joe finishes that tank. Now, I thought maybe I could get away with having one coat of clear as a way of saving some weight. Nah. And over here, the other part of this is I don't have to fuel proof it. There's nothing here that has to be fuel proofed. We're going to put one coat on, let it dry, then put a second coat. You see the little shine that's on here? Now, what, when I reach the point where I can just see a gloss, it doesn't have to look like it's covered with saran wrap, but just that little gloss, then I know I've got enough dope on here that I can do my second sanding. And I'll just rough this out. Nothing, nothing real elaborate here. I just want to dust it off because the wood cells have been expanded and contracted, and especially over places where there's a joint, I want to get it as flat as possible. And up in the fillets, I'll get my curved tools up there. But now, even though this has only been drying a, a half a day, it's already powdering off. If you turn it over and you see little balls of chewing gum, you know you gotta let it dry a little more. But now what I'll do is I'll give this one more, once it's sanded down, one more coat of clear. That'll be the third, you can see the powder on my hand. Third coat of clear, let that dry, and go right into tissue in it. Now this is the part I really have to rush through because basically I never do dope in the house except when Karen's going to be gone for the whole day. And then I open up all the windows and leave the heat on and turn fans on and... And then she comes home and says, that stinks in here. And she's right, it does. 
So I don't have much of a case. Even Johnny Cochran couldn't make a case for my innocence, but when she comes home, she'll probably be mad. But I want to get this done because we're coming up on a weekend, and I want this to be dry. And now, I always cover the stuff wet. I take a piece of soap span, spray it with Windex, it's, no matter what I'm doing. I like to cover wet, medium tissue. Usually, here's my brush. Usually I can get it on relatively wrinkle free, but never for sure. Now, I would never want to put tissue anywhere near some aeropoxy light fillets. That's a no-no. Now, I always take my bare hands for some reason, whenever I try doing it with a method other than the old bare hand method, I get those little bubbles like Rich had in his plane. In fact, even sometimes doing this, you get a bubble or two. Pressing it down, getting the dope to go right down through. Again, plenty of dope. This is not a place, right now, is not a place to save weight. Now usually it's best if I just let this dry just a little bit. In this case, I'm gonna cover that other piece before I do the other side. I'll have plenty of wet tissue. Hey! But I was gonna have to do this alone, but it looks like I have a helper here. Hey! Hey, I don't need the help. Go help Don Dixon. Here. Look, I know what'll make him happy. Here, go. See, that's called bribery. Anyway, once this is dry just a little bit, I can just trim it up. It's easy to trim once it dries up just a little bit. And all right, it seems like a lot of people in the beginning may have trouble with tissue. And then once they get a little demo or a little thing going on, they become mavens, they kill better than me. Now again, it's still just a little bit tacky. I'm going to keep pressing it down, babysit it a little bit. Slid up by the hinges so that I even have tissue down in the hinge pockets. I have a lot of, it, for some reason, I'm, I wonder why I didn't think it was tissue in the body thing when I did Miss Ashley. That primer really, the more I think about it, I think about that, all that primer on there unnecessarily. Now, I can also, right at this point in time, just lay on the next coat. And then this will have to sit for an hour or so. Again, pressing it down with my bare hands. And that seems to be a method that you get a real good tissue adhesion. Now the trick with a part like this is to not get any tissue. If you get tissue up on the fillet here, to, to maintain a little bit of clearance away from that fillet, same thing down here, tissue may be within an eighth of an inch of that. But if you start tissuing anywhere near that fillet that wants to pull up and you run the risk of getting, having a, the paint lift or bubble or whatever. So the first thing I want to do, because I can dope over it, the dope won't hurt anything. I want to pick the flattest areas. Plenty of dope, not a good place to save dope. Because it's, whatever's extra is gonna come right up through the tissue anyway when you press down. Get a nice healthy coat on. I'm always amazed, this really did take a long time to do. You don't really notice it in the video, but. But the advantage from this point on, see it was like you pay me now, pay me later. Now, we, now we're ahead of the game. Now finishing this, putting inclines on it, putting the trim. So I want to stay away from that fillet. I don't want to go up on that fillet at all. You really run a high risk when you don't get enough dope between the tissue. And because this is going to be the, the first carbon fiber one fuselage that we did this way, 
but I know what Miss Ashley weighed. I have all those weights accurately written down. Let's see just how much it, I'm looking to save maybe a half an ounce. That's realistic. Again, I put so many coats of primer on that to fill all those little divots. The same way you would have to fill wood grain, if you fill wood grain without tissue, if you just take raw wood and keep putting coats of dope on it, you're filling the wood grain with solid dope. So I can cover right up, right up to the fillet. You can see where the tissue ends, and I'll end it right here. It's a little separate piece there too, but nothing in the fillet. Part is tissue. What I'm doing, I'm going to add a second layer to some of the places where there are joints. The reason for this is maybe I'll even add two layers. Is because this this acts like a filler in some ways, and then I can when the, put the two pieces together when they're in silver and sand around them, it'll give me an exact. It'll act like a gasket more or less. A little bit of extra tissue that really adds a lot of strength too. Oh, one of the place I want to put an extra layer of tissue because it acts like a little bit of a reinforcement and it'll allow me when I get the actual rudder sanded out and on its hinges and I can do a final sanding and get a perfect match. This also adds a little bit of strength to keep it from warping. It's a little bit like a spar or a brace. Because the fillet area is relatively flat here, we don't have to worry. It's one area where a lot of people, and I'm just thinking of people that I've helped at the shop here, they add an incredible amount of weight without realizing, because they're trying to fill it fill a grain of the wood, I think, with, with dope or with filler or with talc or whatever. And once you tissue something, you can, you can dramatically cut that amount of material down. And it adds the strength all at the same time. So it's kind of the best of all worlds. Area, wherever I'm going to have a joint, I'm going to put a little bit of extra tissue just to act as a kind of like an, can't a, a gasket is not the right word, but it'll give me a soft little extra finish to get that joint married up to. Again, a little detail, maybe unnecessary, maybe overkill, I don't know. But the nice thing, if you have something that's overkill or a little bit over the top or a little bit of a, and you decide not to do it, fine. But if you decide, you always like to have that option. The option to make things as good as you possibly can. And I think the pursuit of that is certainly one of the things that drives me. I just, I can't imagine building a plane and all along in the construction of it saying, ah, that's good enough, that's good enough. I, it would kind of defeat the whole purpose of doing it. Just got a little wrinkle out of here. Anyway, this part's ready to put aside. I'm going to take a coffee break here because I want to do the fuselage. I want to sand it a little bit. Just dust off those coats of dope that are dry now and get the whole fuselage tissued with medium tissue. Now I've been trying to. I don't want to sand off all the dope. I just want to sand, I feel like there's little spots, dust, dirt, whatever it is that gets in there. But I certainly want to leave on enough of the dope. 
Now, this area here, where there's a reverse curve, I'm going to tissue close to it, but not into it. I don't want you tissue into a, into a fillet or a reverse curve that just wants to lift right out. Now, I don't know how much, how many joints I'm going to be able to, I'm going to try to do as few joints as possible, but... And this wouldn't matter if it, if it were a wood or a carbon fiber fuselage. I like to kind of work fast, give myself the benefit of the drying time as well. Now I'll go way past the area where I want to put the joint. And I'll do the same thing. I'll build up any place that's going to be a joint with double or triple tissue. Okay, what I did, I took a whole sheet of tissue. Let's see if this is going to work. Up in heaven she be Now I'll try working from the middle out. That was lucky, by the way. Remember, I have to avoid those reverse curves. This is another place where you gain, and you don't even realize it. When you're building a plane and the wing is in place, well, this part of the job is a nightmare. You're always working around. This one, you can just lay it right out. It's really not a big deal at all. Now, even, even if I have to put joints in here, and I will, of course, it's not a big deal. Remember, what I don't want to do is have it on the fillets. I don't want to have it in that group, in that little trough down there. Now it's that area right there that I want to avoid. So I can pull that piece of tissue right out. And kind of work some of these little wrinkles out. Again, even if the wrinkles are in there, they're going to sand out. It's just making a little, saving myself a little sanding. Okay, I have nothing in the joint. Now I want to get all the material away from that fillet. I don't want to go anywhere as near that fillet. So now the next cut will be... I know when you do a fuselage with a wing in place, you're guaranteed you have to do more joints than this. The few wrinkles we're going to have in here in the final product, I don't even think it's going to be a factor. Again, I'm going to double up the tissue at the edges, just using my bare hand to press it right down. And whatever wrinkle stays in there, <laughs> there used to be times I do a fuselage that looked like when it was done, it had was done with postage stamps. I think we really could do this with it, with about two or three joints and a whole job, except for the edges we want to double up. Nothing better than the old hands-on method. Okay, now that's got to dry up. We will put it up on a heating vent with the other parts. Maybe get the sand it out later today, or if we get busy, we'll work on it tomorrow. Now, peeps, just the latest thing.
the latest thing is he's taking sandpaper and putting it in his cage. He takes one little piece at a time. Hey! And he's molting. He's losing feathers all over the shop. The odds were a hundred to one against me. I've got the, the first coat is dried and I've been trying to just do a little sanding. I don't want to go through the paper. I just want to get the fuzz off. And I'm looking for, with my bare hand, any spot that doesn't feel real good. Because from this point on, I'll probably sand between every two coats, let's say. Well, what's nice about using this sandpaper like this is you, you tend to really pick up the high spots. Again, this whole finishing thing is not possible with other materials because the dry time, we've basically done this whole finish from, from raw wood to where actually, I don't know if we're going to get another coat on today. But we can get the bulk, the bulk of the substrate done in one day. And the whole trick is, as always, when it powders off, you know you're home free all. You can see where we put the extra pieces extra pieces so I can just blend them right in around the edges and I had a little defect there I filled in boy that just powders right off that's ready for another coat the important thing that I found is every step of the way from this point on is to radius all the edges just run the paper down them once is even enough but to get a radius on them because if you make a sharp edge and that paint starts to peel up, not much can save your day. And that is really frustrating after you put a lot of work in. That's why our little air outlets, that looks like it's going to be fine. Again, I'm using my hand. Here's a rough spot right here. Where we had a wrinkle in the tissue. But after two or three coats of dope and sanding it out a couple of times, even the worst wrinkle disappears. This is dry overnight. There's two coats of clear on top of the tissue, and I'm trying to candle it to see if you can get a feel for just how smooth this is. This is only the second day that we're working on this finish. So first thing I want to do, and we have hit a unique opportunity today that's, that's almost unheard of here in North Jersey, is the temperature is up to 40 degrees. We have no snow whatsoever outside, but we're expecting a northeaster with 12 inches coming tomorrow. So I'm going to basically spend a day, I'm, re I'm really rushing, I'm trying to make up time here. Normally I would let each coat dry overnight. So what I'm going to do from this point on is I'm going to spray it. Now you can see, you look right here, you can see some of the little, I'm not sure I can candle this. First thing is, it's coming off as powder. That's telling you that it's, it's ready. Again, I'm sanding it. The reason a lot of people have have this ongoing problem of building up a lot of weight in the finish, we all put the same amount of dope on, but I sand a lot of it off. Now you could sand, the things that are that are self-evident here, you could sand it all off and go right to real wood. That's no good either. The trick to pick up off the video is how much to sand off and when to go from brushing to spraying. Now I've tried right in the very beginning right after the tissue's on to start spraying and that's not real effective because what happens with a spray you get a lot more thinner in the mix and it tends to just make more work but at this point on we're only a coat or two of clear away from being able to put silver on i'm guessing one or two spray coats and because we have this unique 40 degree day out there believe me you don't get them that often in the middle of february you just don't get them
Now that's ready from this point on. I just what I wanted to show is just how much sanding. I don't spend hours and hours and hours and hours. What I do spend time on every time I put finish on is get the edges clean. Every edge, every little corner. Because it's the corners that you're going to buff through. All these little corners and edges. That's where you're, you're not vulnerable out here. You're never going to buff through right out there. And again, to hit our weight, we'd like to have between seven and eight ounces of total finish on the plane. I think if you do less than that, you're not going to have a front row finish. And if you do more than that, you're just taking it for a ride every time you do a square eight or an overhead eight. We don't need to do that either. But this should now do the fuselage and the other parts. This is pretty much ready. I'm guessing one or two spray coats on this. We may even get a coat of silver on this, depending. See, now again, this is Brodak dope, the nice thing. It's about 12 o'clock. I'll get a coat on at 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, a coat on at maybe 3 o'clock, and a coat just before it gets dark. I, I might get this in silver today. On the second day, have the wood parts in silver. And years ago, believe me when I tell you, don't even think about two days in silver. You just have chewing gum on a sandpaper, you feel like you're working a chewing gum factory. And that's why I always felt all the time and energy I put into this Brodak dope development, it wouldn't only benefit me, but it benefits everybody. It benefits the poor winters of the world that are trying to learn how to do good finishing. And, and just makes it easier. The rich jack of bones. All the people that really want to have those front row finishes, but they don't want to pay. You, know, you don't want to do 20 years at, uh, at Rikers Island to get them. You want to do it quick, and you want it to work every time. And I think that's the key to all this Brodak dope stuff. That's ready for our clear. Now on a part like this, some of the things I want to be real careful of, again, edges, corners. I try to do as much as I can with the block, but you certainly can't do it all. There's always some areas you, a block is just not appropriate, but I want to radius all the edges. This is key, because that's where you're going to buff through. Now, where I blended this in, again, another very, it's going to be a focal point where our fudge area is here. And I built up all these areas with a little extra silk span, so when I marry these together, I can block sand them down once they're in silver, pick out all the high spots, and that should put a, a real nice final fit. I mean, we're, we're removing and taking the amount of the thickness of a piece of silk span when we do that. Again, a trick is, and it's so hard to explain it, that's why I think video is a, is a key thing. You could write about this a million times and you'd never be able to convey it, is how much do you sand off? You don't want to go down to bare wood. You don't want to just keep sanding and sanding for nothing. You want to sand, and I always use my hands, even though my hands are kind of chewed up from the work I do. I can feel when those seams, those seams where the extra silk span layers are, when they kind of disappear, that part's ready. I also have all my little rubber pieces, and I don't know how you could do some of these shapes and sizes. For instance, right in here, if you tend to do this, you, make, you tend to make ditches right at the end. The trick is just to, just to kind of tough it out, because this, this really does take a little longer than it would be the other way. But once you see, now see, you can see there's a little, there's a little spot right there that's low. Well, I can just sand around it until I see I'm flat on all the surfaces. I mentioned something. A lot of people, they, they don't take advantage of little things like a break in the weather. Now, that's another thing when we're building a model and we're finishing it in pieces like we are. There's always a piece ready for silver, a piece ready for... In fact, if we got done with all this sand, I could start painting invasion stripes, stripes and round L's. While we're doing the cockpit, we could be laying out some of the trim. So, I try to balance on these take-apart planes, where the gain is, where the loss is. Making all these edges, yeah, it takes a little time, but I think I've covered most of the shortcuts that I've found. 
But from this point on, the finish, as having this plane in our hands like this in little pieces, I mean, I've always felt, if you have a plane, especially with the elevators on already, oh my God, you, it's, it's a nightmare. You, you almost, you, you want to uh, bite the steering wheel by, in a car when you're done sanding it. Again, I try to get all the flat areas with a block, all the curved areas with a nice little, uh, one of those little rubber things, and I have several sizes, and most of all, all the edges. Break the edges every time you sand the coat. Well, I just wanted to see how my, my little test of the tissue and the carbon, because this is going to need less clear. This is one coat less of clear. Again, all we need to do is build up a flat substrate. This is what the sticky back sandpaper helps you achieve too. See, from seeing how, how this is sanding out, one thing I can be sure of is I didn't need the second coat of clear. I could have gotten away with one coat of clear, I think. Again, another weight saving. Every time you can shave off a coat here or a coat there. So what I'll do is I'll just basically sand this until I see I'm almost going through. Yeah, I really didn't need that second coat. I can see, see how much I'm sanding this? This is way too much. This is a valuable lesson to learn here is not to put so much on the car. See, that's where you save on a carbon part too. You're not filling grain and loading it up with filler. There's going to be no filler at all on this. We're going to go right from clear to silver. And I want to see if we can just eliminate all the filler. Even on those little pieces at the tail. Eliminating the filler is going to be, a, I think, the next goal we're going to have with our Brodac Dose development. Just totally bypassing it and figuring out how much clear we need to put on there. And you can see that's... That doesn't get a lot detected. That almost has a shine to it. Put the extra layers of silk span around the edges and the corners. I'll just sand them in until I can't feel the joint. They blend right in. Same thing with the air epoxy light. You can even do this by hand almost. You can just... You can see how quickly you can blend in an air epoxy light fillet. And the idea is on a fillet not to build up a lot of paint, don't But especially if you're using something with talc in it. Anything with talc near a fillet almost guarantees you're going to have a problem. If you're doing talc, you want to bring the talc right down but not out onto the fillet. I prefer that's one place I really would use the Brodax primer. But I want to see if I can get rid of all the primer. See, the idea is... This fuselage is lighter than the Ashley fuselage, and I don't want to build up a lot of paint on it right now. It's a bigger fuselage, too. And it's going to house a bigger engine, so we're making progress. If I were to build this out of wood, this probably would be more than three ounces heavier in wood. Yeah, you can't even feel that. And we're going to take advantage of a good spray day right now. Really sand it out quickly and nicely, and I've learned a critical thing again. I've learned I need two coats of clear on the tissue and no more than one on this, but I'm going to spray on the next coat and I hope that coat will be the base for the silver. Same thing here, I'm going to take this outside, spray a coat, and I think that'll be the base for our silver. Now from this point on, I'm hoping I'm going to be able to spray all my coats of clear. I'm anticipating I might need two on the wood parts, one on the carbon. Let's see how good, how good of an anticipator I am here. Hang on one second. But it's laying down beautifully. Now, it's funny, up till an hour ago, we had some sunlight out here, but they say a nor'easter, which up here means big storm, is coming in. By the way, we finally got our official, we are an official Sato dealer. 
And we're having some Venturis made up, so if anybody would like to get on the list for a motor or Venturis, we hope to have them soon. What's nice is the ability of this material to just lay down when you want it to. The, the amount of hours you spent, you save not having to sand more than with other materials. That's about as easy as it gets. I just <laughs> this is the part where I really feel we could make some kind of a saving. I'm going to try to get away with just one more coat of dope on this. How are you doing? How are you? Good. Let me just see if I can get this up close. I think that's going to be ready for silver. I'm not so sure you could even you get away without having this coat on here. But again, each year we're making a little progress. Now this is one of the things on the carbon wing that we're going to take advantage of. Woody is putting tissue on the carbon as a way of trying to save the primer. Of course you can always leave it black, but that really does limit your choices. Remember, a spray coat is about one third the amount of material as a brush coat. And what this will do will just save us from having to resand any extra times. We need to put this aside to dry. And it's very pleasant that it can stay out here and dry. That's certainly going to be a help to us. And we will let that dry overnight. Come back and see if we're going to need more sanding or possibly give it a coat of silver tomorrow. But if we get the Nor'easter, it's really going to set us back. And I suspect, like the way it's getting gloomy and cloudy, I suspect we're already, we've already missed the train here. We have this little break in the weather and we're waiting for dope to dry. One of the things I've been itching to do is get some time on this laser. See if I can get it started, get it broken in as per the instructions.
we're done with this, we'll get maybe two tanks of fuel and we'll be done. And of course, this is one of the engines that we're going to test. We're going to leave it in, it's about 4,000 RPM now. We're going to leave it this way for the first half an hour. Incredible, the idle is incredible on this. This this is running under a thousand RPM right now. Just sitting here grinding away. You get a feel for why the scale guys love this motor. It's got a totally scale sound. We're running it on GMA fuel, it started right up. It, I didn't even use the electric starter to start it, the battery was dead. I got it on charge right now. Started right up by hand on about the tenth flip. I oiled it as per the instructions. It needs to have a shot of oil in the crankcase every three hours of running. So what we want to do is an extreme, extreme good braking on this. This is one of the engines I really want to work with in the future. Well, one of the things that was really nice is it came from the factory with the carburetor already adjusted. A lot of them don't come adjusted. you got to kind of figure out the needle set. It came right from the factory adjusted. They recommend up to 12% nitro. This is 5% fuel. Just one of the many engines we want to test in the next year in our test planes and possibly in the Typhoon. This motor was donated by Elliot Scott who might wind up with it in his Typhoon. We don't know yet, but I just love testing these motors. I love learning about them and I love comparing them. Think to hear if the sound of this motor is going to pick up on the video. What a piece of quality equipment though, boy, oh boy, that's really, that's really got me thinking. This motor is exactly the same weight as the Max 70. It's about three ounces, two or three quarter ounces heavier than the Sato 72, and roughly the same as the 91, the Sato, so this will add a lot of interesting dimensions. Those mu the muffler and uh, intake can be rotated at will. We're going to have an interesting summer coming up. under a thousand RP. It will, but you can't shut the throttle real quick. The, the 
back and light it didn't empty. I, I filled about two thirds of it up. We got a little over an hour on the engine. It started out pulling about 92, 93. It's pulling almost 10 grand right now. Going down under 500 RPM according to this pack. I'm assuming this pack is right. on that 300, 340 RPM, 350 RPM. Anyway, a very, very interesting afternoon. Glad I did this. Oops. I'm used to using the electric starter. Now, I always have to remember, because the tank is way below the engine, now this engine bumps like a Tiger 60. I'm, I'm very surprised at that. The other ones don't seem to bump. What I did, I tried to light a fluid just for a prime to see if it would kick right over and it does just like a two-stroke. about the starting because this tank is so low we can't it doesn't draw fuel you have to keep prime more or less prime it just starts like a pussy cat it's unbelievable We're just going to let it run out this tank of fuel, at which point it'll have over an hour, a lot over an hour running. Our dope should be dry, maybe we can even get the silver sprayed this afternoon. 
You know what's funny is I haven't I haven't really had castor oil on my hands in about four months, three months, I don't know, a long time. And you get out here and it's just like it was yesterday. It's such a the smell, the feel of the oil. It just doesn't get any better than this, except we are expecting a big storm. <laughs> Final test before we run out of fuel here. I wanted to check a couple of these exhaust restrictions. And as always, they cut a they cut a hundred or so RPM out. So if you're running an engine like we are in a driveway, and we've been we've been running this all afternoon, I guess the neighbors are good to stick it here by now. Very, very interesting afternoon. How's this for a great summer day? Look at this view. I wanted to run the motorcycle. I wanted to get the snowblower ready for the big storm. I wanted to clean the garage. So while I'm doing it, I think I give this motor a little more time. Just let it, you don't even hear it running. It's as quiet as this Suzuki is. I am really impressed with this motor. I am. I can't wait to get this down at the field. having this this great day that we've had and with the day's not over yet I'm going to try to get that silver on the last thing of the night got the run time in this and I wanted to th there's just a couple of gut impressions that I have that are first off the needle settings low speed and high speed are just infinitely easy to adjust I didn't have any trouble and it came set from the factory that's a nice little touch some of the motors do some don't one of the things I really was impressed, and I really have to mention this, this is something that I'm really excited about. This muffler, by the way, it comes right off with one, one retaining screw. And what I did, I went around this before with the wrenches they give you, and the, my objective was to see if any of the screws were loose. And you know what? Nothing is loose. This motor is just incredible. Now you take one, you loosen one screw, and I wasn't so sure in the beginning that this was going to be a like a usable thing, but I really like the way this muffler sounds. Usually after running a motor in a, on my yard here, I usually get some looks from the neighbors. They didn't even know I was running it. Now, a couple of real interesting things here. You can see, I showed this on a close-up. I always look, this is because I didn't have the breather nipple. The breather nipple in the back here is... I should have put a piece of tubing on it, but with the breather nipple, when it's pumping oil out, you know the motor's getting lubricated, so that's a good sign. And that lubrication, by the way, works up the push rods and does the valves too. One of the things about the muffler I had thought about right away, since we wanted to test the, uh, oh boy, this is frozen right on now, we wanted to test the, the 91 as the primary motor in a plane. But of course, we'll be testing this. We'll, we were going to do a lot of stuff. This but I looked at how nice this muffler was, and I thought maybe I can just go get one of these mufflers from the laser company. I'm sure they sell them as accessories. And get this front part threaded with, with the Sato threads or make an adapter. But if anybody out there is a real machinist or a rocket scientist or something, they can figure out a better way. The only other problem with that would be that when you, when you locked it in, it would have to sit there. You'd need a locking nut. But anyway, more about that later. What I did come away thinking, and I guess it's, uh, I'm kind of excited about it, is just how so this motor, now it's all cooled down, it's got a little over an hour, but the compression is absolutely unbelievable. This feels like it has more compression than the 90, 91, but the 91 isn't broken in yet. And we still have Gerald's 80 to work. A big thing that I like was how easy the carburetor adjusted it. I know this is a carburetor that belongs on another engine. Laser doesn't make carburetors. But it could be that we can adapt this carburetor to... Um, and that, that's a whole other area. Or, or, of course, just make Venturi's. But anyway, we did get it running. And I, it, it's like being a drug addict. You get, I, get, I just love the feel and the smell and the, the sound. I love it all. But I did the whole test with an OS Max plug. But what I'm going to do here, and this, maybe I ought to do it right now. So I'm trying to let that dope dry so I can get the silver on while it's as dry as possible. 
I want to clean this off and, and kind of polish this just a little bit so it'll be easier to get the oil stains off. It looks like the, and another test of quality with a motor is, does it drip and drool oil everywhere? You can look at this motor. I looked at this under my loop. I didn't see a leak anywhere. There wasn't a leak by the push rods. I, the only place it's oozing oil, of course, it, and that's showing you that it's, it's getting lubricated. And it looks like we had possibly a drip of fuel or something because it, it isn't leaking past the o-rings you can see the o-rings are clean as a whistle so anyway this will be a very interesting test i'm real excited about it hope i can get one of these mufflers from uh or actually just make one from scratch and they're, they're so small it wouldn't even matter if you make them out of aluminum a nice motor just wanted to put real quick up here you know elliot scott donated this to our cause and as I said, this is this was one impressive motor to run in. And they make a, by the way, they're on a website. I like this saying, the excellence of engineering. Quite a piece of work, like the jet, like the PA, like most of the modern motors, the double stars. Just incredible quality. When you think back to what old ignition motors were and, and things like that, we've come a long way. Mufflers made. This is really a piece of work. It's got a baffle inside. It's got a baffle tube inside. Now, anytime you bend sound 90 degrees, supposedly you lose half of the uh, half of the amount. And I like the way this is made. I think this could be adapted to a say. It could be adapted to anything, really. Really nicely made. I have to pull this apart. It comes apart here. I can see. Um, or just and or just replicate it or buy one. Anyway, the stuff that the, the group from not having the fitting, and that's my own fault. 1,200 sandpaper, usually take it right off. You see, I don't want to take the pictures off. And this would work on a two cycle, a four cycle. And on a missing muffler, a tongue muffler. You always want to polish it with 1,200 first. And the group comes right off. Once you get it off, then I can just polish it with a little bit with the buffing wheels and gorms or whatever. Nice little unit. This is this is a nice little accessory item. But this is what you learn. And that baffle in it, that's, that's very interesting how they've done that. The Sato muffler is much smaller, but again, interesting stuff. We've learned a lot today. Just as a reference, look how nice that fits up in the nose. You wouldn't even need that big chin cow. You could use a much smaller cow. day but we proved one thing we can go from raw wood to our first coat of silver and in two days and break in a laser and get ready for the big storm Now, sometimes I like to do things, even though they don't have a real firm purpose. I just like to see if I can do them. And today was one of the days I said, if I can get this stuff in silver, well, then I can weather the storm. Because remember, I have three houses to snowball. Actually, four with that one right there. But thanks to Blow that Coat, <laughs> oh, I wish I could say that. Anyway. This will be our first coat of silver. We don't know if it'll take two, three, four. And it'll be drying while we're shoveling and plowing and whatever. That's some motor, that laser. Boy, oh boy. That blows me away. And we're open to all kind of ideas for those little mufflers. Those What's nice about a four-stroke muffler, it has to be so small, it can just be half the size of a two-stroke muffler to really work, too. Anyway, this looks like this part will need two coats. Just my rough gut feeling up where the double six pin is, it's a little dry. Other than that, it doesn't look too bad. Now what? 
the silver's letting me do here real quickly. You see any little flaws? See the little flaw up by the nose there? Little spots that I might have missed. There's just no substitute for putting that coat of silver on. Not that I've found. And you can see up there there's one little spot we need to work on. As always, today I'm going to really put the push on because we have been told that the storm is only hours away. So I'm running trying to get another coat of silver on this. But what I wanted to do, because we're trying to do this with no filler at all, I wanted to, well, I'll do one up under the camera, but give you an idea of just how much effort goes into getting this coat of silver off. I'm using 500 sand, no, no, this is 600. I had 500 before. I was going to try some 500 and then I punked out. What happens with, with rougher grits, you, it leaves sanding scratches and you have to do it over with 600 anyway. But anyway, so far it looks like this coat of silver acted as we suspected. It's showing the little tiny flaws. Let me get this up close, but you can see now, just as an example, some of the spots we didn't even see, in the next coat of silver they'll all disappear. See now, a spot like this, you would never even see it. You don't see it when it's in clear. You, you almost can't feel it yet when you sand it out. And this is this is about the point at which I want to stop sanding. Remember, I don't want to go back down to raw wood. I want to leave just the little low spots, the little edges. And when I get all up, now that when I get everything looking like this, even a fuselage, then I'm going to try to get out there and get one more coat of silver on this because then it looks like we're going to be housebound for a while. Again, this is the whole idea of doing the silver, is you can pick up these little low spots that you really can't see. Now, if we were using filler, these would have already been filled by filler, but what we're trying to do is fill them with silver right now. And I don't know that this is going to really work. If it doesn't, I can always put on a coat of filler. I'm always trying to push a little bit and get a little bit more of the material, make it thinner and thinner. You know, you can see how many little errors, how many little flaws were in that part. But they'll all disappear in the final coat of silver. And the seams where double tissue are, always you need to get that as flat as can be. Now while I'm going through some of the old footage again, I've been replaying the 93 Nats footage. I came across something really cool. There's some footage of uh, Hoffman's, Hoffelder, not Hoffman, what am I thinking about soda here? Retracks, and I was just, it just, the little light went off in my head, wow, that's something with Zetron would be really practical. Hey, that's some cool old footage. <laughs> This, this was one of the things I always thought was cool. So you, you don't, you forget these things. By the way, this is 94, not 93. Shows you what kind of memory I have. But watch this. Now this, this, just picture, here's the Typhoon. You're getting ready to, Bob Whiteley, of course, had his Mustang with the Retrax. I just happened to catch this out of the corner of my eye. Check this out. Motor stops. And you keep thinking, are they going to come down? Are they going to come down? That might be happening sooner than you think. Now, most importantly of all, I emphasize this, are the edges. All of these edges. Once you, be, you create a razor edge, it's almost impossible to get the paint not to come off. Anyway, that re don't think, because don't forget, all these Z-trons are three-channel. And I know guys like Wolf Brownell are already using two of the channels. Oh, I can't wait to see the two Typhoons side by side. We're already thinking about possibilities for next year's plane, and one possibility certainly is going to be 
three tracks. Anyway, I love having that old footage. But it, the things you forget and you look at that footage and a year goes by, two years, ten years, fifteen years, and then you remember things that you don't even remember you remembered. In sanding I want to do is up in the nose section here. I had a spot up here where it, it was a little rough. Spot down here. First thing I always like to see, make sure I'm going to get a good, a good cut on the paint that the paint is dry enough. Oh, I love when this paint dries quick like this. There's a lot less things to fill on a carbon part. That's the trick. There's a lot less filler, and I think we've really lucked out figuring out how to get get rid of the primer and get the tissue on there. I think that's going to be a major saving. We finally got this all sanded out. And it has already started to snow, so we're going to just rush and get the silver on this. Now today, our segment for this piece is going to be uh, some really neat footage. By the way, this is one of my favorite pieces to watch. From the 1993 mats, we had some days with just perfect flying weather. This is Casmanato. We only get to see Cassy maybe every, uh, I don't know, seven, eight, ten years. I don't know. He's been to my house, been to my shop. We do a lot of corresponding, and he has got a similar business to mine going in Japan. Casmanato from the 93 Nets. And this is a pretty memorable flight. He flew well. By the way, he made the top, the top five that year. I think he finished over <coughs> fifth. <coughs> Cassie. How about some respect? That's my spot.
but I heard what you said too. <laughs> what? That they were pretty he well has trained? well trained. We work hard at training. Ninety-three was a great year for Cassie. And I love looking back at that old footage. Great. It's like watching your life unfold over and over again. Great footage. Kaz Manato. I got the silver on all the parts. And what I try to do, and I do it in every step of silver, and this is this is the step that separates those last few planes and the last few rows. I look around and I try to find little spots and I put some of my <coughs> pretty. Any place I'm not happy with, I, I see a little spot and it could just be a pinhole spot. But now when I sand this out, I'm, the, this, this should be, let's hope, you know, we always hope, it'll be that last coat of clear, last coat of silver. I'm already thinking about the clear. You can tell I'm excited about this. And shoveling snow. I'm so sick of shoveling snow. It's good to come in and do some uh, do some modeling. Anyway, by picking around, now you can see around here just a couple of things. Where the double silk span is, what I'm going to do is bolt all the parts together at the end of this and then pick up the higher of the two sides so that there's a really nice match. I'm looking for that real nice match. Anywhere I put double tissue, I'd like to do that. I put some, I think there's some double tissue here. But it comes right up to the forefront. And then the last thing will be to get one really nice, smooth, thin coat of silver on the whole part. Look at this little part. I'm picking away at it, finding every little spot that I think might show up in the final finish. And you know when you see the tissue seams like this. When you see the seams, you know you're about one, maybe two coats away from having the final coat of silver on there. This always lets me know I might have two, but more than likely one. On this last, the last few sand outs, I, the choices are to use 600. 600 cuts real nice. And then for that final little just before I put the last coat of silk, last coat, and I hope it will be, the trick will be to do it with 1200. The 1200 will have no sanding scratches in the final part. Now, you could do this with a block if you're going on a perfectly flat area. This has a little bit of a curve to it, so I'm hesitant to do it with a block. Again, this stuff, this green, <laughs> green, Cat, I should say, instead of pretty. Sand so quickly that the feather edges in. And what you're looking for here, let me show this. All parts of a good repair or a good finish is the feather edge. See, that's a feather edge where you, it just disappears. It doesn't have a, a step. And once the whole part is done, even though it's snowing, we're going to have to go out in the garage and spray this. This is this. It really is snowing out there. But I'd like to get this done in between snowblower trips. And if I can get this last coat on today, I'll be I'll be one happy puppy. It's just a question. A lot of good finishing is not a question of high tech stuff. It's just doing ordinary stuff, common sense stuff, over and over until you're happy with it. And at the level you pick, put your last coat of silver on and go paint the plane. Well, the rudder for all purposes is finished. And I think we're one coat away on the fuselage and on that little tail section. But again, you can be as fussy as you want. And if you want to just put one, if you don't want to do any, it, <laughs> but this is a way and the trick, the part of this that works every time is it's light. Because that silver doesn't let you get by with, it shows you every mistake. And that's the whole, I've tried to eliminate the silver several different times. In this case, we've eliminated the filler. There's no talc at all on this. But we haven't been able to, certainly not be able to uh, eliminate the silver. The silver is what gives you that, that look at what every little mistake is. Well, this is what a 
out and edged it's feathered in nicely should look like and hopefully in the final coat of silver you will even see that a little spot up by the nose all these little spots it may seem like a lot of extra work but when you're done you'll know you did it after this coat of silver dried you can see Right in the corner here is the tiniest little bubble. Well, if you're going to be a fanatic and you're going to really want to upgrade your skills or whatever, I mean, this gets to the point where you can do this forever. But there's always a point at which you find a little bubble and the silver does show you the bubbles. You let it sit for a second, wipe it, twist, twist the Q-tip as you wipe it, and that kind of presses it down at the same time. And of course, you'd when it dries and just sand that little area. Look around and see. Now here, right here, we have another candidate. See that little? Let's see if you can see right there. Well, you can see how loose the tissue is there. It's it's the same as rich at. It's a spot where there should have been just a little more dope, but nothing you can't handle. It's never to the point that you can't just get it to, to sock right down. Just twist it as you... Now, a lot of times, you don't even have to sand it down, but in this case, that's probably dry already. And because we already have, we always have a gun with silver in it. There's always a gun in the shop with silver ready to do this touch-up. We do this at an, at an ongoing, an ongoing thing. The next thing we're going to do is make the canopy, the cockpit area. Well, we're going to have the silver in the gun for that whole period of time. Let me just get one square bit. But this is important. I think important. You're always going to have. There's always going to be little spots where you have bubbles, and you always need to be able to just, just feather them in. I want to go down a bare wood here. We'll be able to just touch that up with silver, and it'll be perfect. Sometimes when I do a spot like this, I like to feather it in quite a bit. And the silver is the whole key. Because each time you're doing this, you're not building up. It's not like doing talc filler where you're building up weight every time you add them. In this case, you're, you're probably taking more off than you're putting on in the ultimate area. And yet, right up to the last coat of clear, in fact, right after the plane is booked, if you see a bubble, that's really the only way I know of to get rid of a spot. And it always seems like there are little spots, as careful as you might be. Once that's re-silvered, it should be pulled. In fact, this should be the last coat. Let's hope. Now, when you have everything in silver, and this is going to dry up here for the rest of the day, there's a feeling you get. I don't know how to describe it, but it's pretty special because you know you've got the lightweight part of this down pat, and you know this is going to translate into a great base coat, a great palette to do your final finish on. This is really the first time we've ever put the whole plane together like this and had it in silver. So we get to get kind of an overview of what this bulldog is going to look like. Mm -hmm. 
and I try to look at it from a lot of different angles and see what I like about it, what I don't like about it, what, what I need to change, what, what I had to fudge and what becomes act at some point in time you just you just can't make it a truly scale model yet because it's a stunt ship. You just can't make the wings smaller or certain other compromises. But I think we've arrived at what will be, uh, should be, could be a, a relatively good rendition of the Typhoon here. Now what I'm doing, just to mention, the next tape we're going to make is going to be centering on cockpit detail, because that's the next step. I have to get a canopy. I don't have one yet. And you see what I'm doing already is I'm already looking at all the tapes from the years, couple of years before to get all my technology, all my ideas, or at least repeat them in my own mind that I know. Because uh, I tend to forget. To tell you the truth, and the older I get, the more I forget. So by coming up with a couple of good videos, and it's good to have them in your library, of course. What's nice about it now is I can start planning out my cockpit. And there's a couple of the details and little fits and things I want to work on. One of the fits up by the nose here, I wanted to just rub a sanding block over that a few times, pick out the high spot. Um, the cowl line came out real nice. The fillet line is about as good as I've ever done. Back here, there's a couple of spots I saw that I wanted to touch up, but nothing big, nothing I can't live without. And it really is a joy to see the model in one piece and be able to start planning the cockpit. I'm really excited about getting that started. I think that once that nose is filled with one of our big four strokes, I think that's going to be, I don't know, I'm kind of excited about it. I have to tell you the truth. I think the bird's excited about eating his phone. What did I tell Notice he's losing all his feathers. He doesn't even have a tail anymore. He's losing feathers. Hey! Away from that phone, you ate the other one. He ate, I already get another phone. This is what I have to do. I have to cover the phone with a rag while he's here. Anyway, I kind of like the rudder. That kind of, it just looks like the SB6. I don't know. That really has a look. Once it's all painted up and it's got the invasion stripes and the cockpit, the canopy, all that stuff. But it's the details that, and it's, it's all these little things like around the horn, the little details that I really think make the model, uh, well, that you're really proud of it. The fit, that fit there is real nice. The wingtips came out of, I thought they really looked special. But I think it's, and of course, because it's a stunt ship, it's this look here that you're always looking at. But she's basically in silver now. There's a few little details left to do. And we'll be ready to do a cockpit canopy and possibly the world's most exotic paint job. Yeah, the real typhoon really does have a fat, short, stubby bulldog look. And that part of it I think we really do have right. Be interesting to see how once we have the canopy installed and some of the invasion stripes, some of the trim painted, how that's all gonna pan out. But so far, to get it to silver up at this point, in what has to be one of the worst winters on the record here, and it's getting worse by the day. All day it's been snowing. I just, I just feel real good now that it's all in silver, and I want to work on the next time I get to work on a couple of the more little details, the fits, dress them off a couple of the edges for a little tighter fit. But it's, uh, we're going to be ready to do a cockpit soon, a day or two. little pieces I wanted to see if I could make a little fillet piece but it's difficult because it has to separate this has to come off with the back piece now if I were to make this attached to the stab of course the problem would it would instantly be this piece would be very weak so what I did I came up with what I thought was a good idea I don't know if this is gonna work I carved the piece that I needed out of balsa wood and then put 64th plywood on all edges now when I go to install it what I'm going to do is carve away all the balsa so it's just a shell. But it'll be a hard edge and it'll add some rigidity back here. And what I did, I just made the part oversized. This was the key, is it has to go around the horn. And needless to say, I need to put it in when it's in neutral. 
also put a couple of coats of thin CA on it just to get it sanded down. But now I'm going to hollow it out. I'm going to get as much of the wood out as I can. So it's just a shell when it goes on. Now, the other side will only have one side because the rave weather linkage has to come out there. You can see what's nice about this is this puts a nice seal around the edge. It also gives me a hard edge, which is going to be my separation line. So in effect, what I've done is just make a little box, and I can carve almost all the balsa, right, because I can just tack glue this in place along the edge. And while it's tack glue, and I'll have it shimmed right up on the actual elevator, so I know I have the correct separation and I don't have the two lines not lined up. So this turned out to be, except for the fact the other side will only be one-sided because it needs that clearance for the ray linkage. But this turned out to be a nice little way to do it, and I can almost, not really, but I can almost pre-finish these by putting a couple of coats of thin CA, sanding them down. And this edge, which is usually difficult to get a nice radius on, one good way I've found to get a nice edge, just use the, the sandpaper roll. Roll off as much paper till you get the angle that you want. And the nice thing about doing it this way, one of the real advantages is this will be nice and hard. The edges will be hard. They won't be prone to picking up fingernail marks and whatnot. So the only thing left here is to hollow this out, and this is ready to install. Now I can get, get a lot of the material out. And of course we're getting to the point where we want to get every last little bit of weight out that we don't need. Just to save finishing time, this will seal the wood, give me a nice hard edge. We should be able to just put a couple of coats of clear or primer or whatever on this and blend in the finish once it's installed. And that's about as light, as light and strong and efficient as you can make that little part. A good way to do it even on a wooden fuselage, even on any plane, it wouldn't matter, even not a take apart plane. Now, I just wanted to tack this in place. And I want to make sure I have enough clearance. Now tack it top and bottom both and then check that I have the right amount of clearance. I just pulled out the 64th plywood shims, two of them. That'll allow for paint buildup. Well, after all the shims are pulled out, the last thing is to make sure I have plenty of clearance and that it's nice and even, and that looks like that's the case. Now, before I make the other side up, what I want to do is take the thing apart and get this... I don't want to do it with the piece in place because if I get hot stuff down in a joint, it'll be a problem. And then. I'll just have to repeat the whole thing on the other side. I think that's going to work out really nice. Now this one, of course, has to be, it's just sheets of plywood, two sheets of 60 foot plywood, so that bullet link has plenty of clearance in there. But of course the last step is going to be the same thing we did is just get a silver finish on here.